Well, thank you, Lynn, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to come to you with y'all tonight and talk a little bit about uh, the company that I work for, Golden State Foods, and talk a little bit about what I do and maybe a little bit about some of the jobs that we have in, in our business. Uh, but before we get started, I'm just going to start off with a little video. I'm going to share my screen. And this is a video that was put out by our uh, product development group. It just kind of shows a little, gives you a little flavor about our company and some of the things that uh, we do um, uh, as a part of our business. So watch along this video. Well, um, I'm going to try to work my way out of that screen to another screen. Um, and as we get started, that, that video is a little bit about our innovation center and the products we make. And you saw towards the end of the video, some of the customers, customers we deal with. And if you looked across there, you probably saw just about every quick serve restaurant. Um, and we do something with, with a lot of the restaurants that uh, you eat, eat at on a, a daily basis or weekly basis. Hopefully it's every day but maybe at least on a, on a good, good occasion. So you should see a screen right now uh, that says everybody eats. Looks and I'll great. talk a little bit about everybody eats, but that was kind of my, uh, one of my decision points in my life that helped me to decide what I wanted to do and um, help to guide me down the path that uh, has led me to where I am today. Uh, but today I wanna to tell you a little bit about who I am and who Golden State Foods is and, and what we do at Golden State Foods. Um, and then I want to get into a little bit about jobs that we have at GSF, but more importantly, these are jobs that are available across the food industry, across the nation, and many companies uh, that deal with food. Um, and then finally, I'll kind of wrap up with, you know, well, how, do, how do you get one of these jobs? How do, you, how do you take on a job like this, or what do you need to do to be prepared? So starting off, um, like I said, my name is Wayne Morgan. I, I grew up in um, 4-H and FFA. I was a club president in my local uh, 4-H uh, chapter and uh, participated in FFA in high school. And I showed lambs predominantly. I showed market lambs and I showed all over Texas and I also showed at the American Royal. And I know this is many, many years ago, probably before most of you are born. Uh, but back in 1984, I had the uh, junior show champion and reserve uh, grand champion at the American Royal. And so um, I showed uh, Charlotte Heifer and um, Houston Livestock Show, and you see a picture here, it's kind of fuzzy, but had a, a champion a scramble heifer at that show. Um, and then, then I ended up going to Texas A&M University in animal science. And uh, I was on the livestock judging there and the judging team and the meat animal evaluation team. And here's 
this is my livestock judging team. But uh, I, I grew up involved in ag agriculture and involved in, um, you know, raising animals, and I loved it. Um, and, and it was a part of my life that I wanted to continue. And I thought about doing other things, uh, but I ended up um, making my way to Texas A&M and studying animal science. Uh, I did have to leave Texas A&M for a while, and I, I joined the Marine Corps Reserves. Um, I, I needed the money. I needed to pay for college, and that was a way for me to pay for college. So I joined the Marine Corps Reserves, came back to A&M, and started working for the Texas Agriculture Extension Service as a student worker and ended up working for the Extension Service all the way through um, my bachelor's, master's, and PhD at Texas A&M University. And I graduated from A&M in 1997, and I went to work for the Texas Beef Council. Um, and I, I, love, I loved working with uh, the Beef Council. It was a great job, um, but I, I felt like I was, I was missing something, and I wanted to do something else. And so I got an opportunity to go to work for Texas A&M, or I go, go interview at Gold State Foods um, in Conyers, Georgia. And, um, and when I left there, I knew it was something I wanted to be a part of. When I took Animal Science 107, that's the introductory animal science class at Texas A&M, the professor there, Dr. Howard Hesby said, there are only three ways to really get into commercial agriculture as a farmer or a rancher. You either are born in it, you marry into it, or you have to win the lottery in order to afford to get into it on your own. Well, I didn't, I didn't have it. I wasn't born into it. I didn't marry it and I haven't won the lottery. So um, I knew it was going to be a difficult road to get me into animal ag agriculture, but, but it was the field I loved and it was what I, I loved doing. So um, I decided while I was working on my master's and my master's was in beef cattle production, I, I looked around and I saw a lot of my friends who were in the meat side had some great job opportunities and they were, they were doing some things that were really interesting. So I switched uh, over to the meat science department when I started working on my PhD to prepare me for what um, later became the field that I would go to work in. So I went to, I went to Golden State Foods for this interview and I fell in love with the place. I loved the people and I loved everything about it. So um, I ended up uh, starting work there in 1998, March of 1998. And over the years, I've done a lot of different jobs at Golden State Foods, but uh, I, I wanna tell you about Golden State Foods and, and maybe then it'll give you a little flavor for why I like it so much. Uh, the company was started in 1947 and we're a global manufacturer uh, supplying food service and retail establishments around the world. And we, we have a lot of different divisions, and I'm going to talk in a little more detail about the di different divisions, but um, the one I work in is, is, we call it our protein department, and we do fresh and frozen beef patties and custom beef and pork grinds. We have a division that does li what we call liquid products, and they do condiments and sauces. We have an ice cream or, or aseptic business that does like um, ice cream mixes and syrups. Uh, we have a fresh produce, produce division, and then we have a distribution business. As I mentioned, we started in Golden State Foods in Southern California, the Golden State, back in 1947. And our, our original founder started kind of working out of the back of his truck, uh, distributing uh, different products to restaurants and retail. But in the late 50s, he partnered with Ray Kroc um, as McDonald's was getting going and starting this franchising business. Um, our founder, uh, partnered with Ray Kroc, and in in, in our business grew with the McDonald's business uh, through from the late 50s on through uh, present. Um, we, we, we started in the U.S., started in Southern California. We ended up building a plant in Conyers, Georgia in 1975. We built a plant in Cairo, Egypt in 1994. We bought a, a produce company in Australia in 94. And we just grew the business on and on. In 2007, we started a quality custom distribution business. And we, and we just kept um, um, accumulating businesses and growing to where we are today. Our most recent two plants, in 2017, we built a new um, protein plant or beef plant in Opelika, Alabama. And then in 2019, we built a new liquid pl liquids plant in Burleson, Texas. So if you take a look at the map, you'll see that, you know, while the, the bulk of our production and, and, and um, facilities are over in the United States, as I mentioned, we have a plant in Cairo, Egypt. 
We have pl a plant in Australia, a couple of plants in New Zealand, and then we have three plants in China. So um, we really do have a global business with uh, facilities across the, across the world. And each one of those businesses are different. And I wanna tell you about each one of them so you can kind of get a, uh, an idea of the diversity of the business that we have. So first of all, I'll talk about uh, liquid products in, in our North American liquid products business. We have three facilities, one in City of Industry, California, which is outside of Los Angeles, one in Conyers, Georgia, which is just east of Atlanta, and then one in Burleson, Texas. So you, you, we have these plants across the, the um, nation, geographically um, you know, located so that we can ship to everywhere in the US, and we export some of the product to other areas of the world. But these plants are, are capable of making a, a variety of different products, mainly for quick serve restaurants and some for um, uh, bulk, but mostly a lot of our business is the individual packets, little sachets or dipping cups that you see when you go to your favorite fast food restaurants. So anytime you see like a, 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 a sachet, for instance, Taco Bell border sauces, we, we package those and we make those and, and send those out for distribution to Taco Bell. We make ketchup for Whataburger. Um, we, we do um, um, Arby's sauces um, in just a, pretty much a whole host of, of uh, quick serve restaurants we may, uh, and including our biggest customer, McDonald's. Uh, we do the sauces, a lot of the sauces for McDonald's, including um, all the nugget sauces, dipping cups, um, ketchup in the packets. We also do the large bulk packs uh, for a lot of their sauces as well. So liquid products is one of our big divisions within GSF. A second division we have is um, um, aseptic dairy products. Uh, and the name of this business is called CanPack. It's a Golden State Foods company, but the name of the business is CanPack. And they have facilities in Arkansas, Kansas, Pinyan, New York, and Jintao, China. So they make like shake mixes, soft serve ice creams, smoothie mixes, they have the capability to do bottled uh, drinks like Ensure drinks and uh, uh, things like that that, you, that, that are uh, shelf stable, shelf stable milk. So all of those are the, and, and even um, yogurts and things. So those things are uh, in those plants in the can pack business. And then we have our fresh produce division. Um, our fresh produce division is located in Auckland, New Zealand, Sydney, Australia, Australia and Guangzhou, China. And again, these, they make both um, lettuce and onions and um, carrots uh, for both retail and for um, our retail part, our, excuse me, our quick service restaurant partners in those parts of the world. My favorite division, which is the division that I'm responsible for is our protein products group. And our facility is in Opelika, Alabama. Our, our main product is uh, hamburger patties from McDonald's. We make both the fresh and frozen hamburgers uh, for McDonald's and we supply the Southeastern part of the United States. We also do custom, custom bulk ground beef products where we grind the meat and um, our customer uses it as a uh, ingredient in their processing. And so here you see some of the statistics regarding what we do on the McDonald's side. But you also see here of the Nestle's business, which is our bulk ground business, that we supply three plants, their manufacturing facilities, one in Ohio, one in South Carolina, and one in Arkansas. And they make products like Stouffer's and Lean Cuisine and uh, frozen entrees. And so we ground meat, we ship them the ground meat, and then they use it as an ingredient in their frozen entrees. Another one of our divisions is our distribution business and it's called Quality Custom Distribution. And we have 18 distribution centers in the US and one distribution center in Egypt. And they make over 17,000 deliveries per week. So what they are, they're considered a last mile delivery. They bring in all the components and all the different things that a restaurant might need. And then they put them together into an order for a particular restaurant and then they ship those to the restaurant and make that delivery behind the scenes so that the restaurant has all the supplies they need. One of our biggest customers for our QCD is Starbucks. 
So all these businesses are very different. They're, they all have the commonality that they're primarily focused on quick serve restaurants. But other than that, and, and they're all food businesses, but other than that, they're really pretty different. But we have one thread that kind of pulls us all back together and that's our company creed and values. And so you'll, if you take a look here at our company creed, I'm not gonna read it all, but the very first line says a lot that we, we believe in dignity we believe in God and the dignity of all people. And that is really one of the tenets of, of our company is that we do believe and we, we, we think that people are the center of our success. And we want to make sure that we're treating people um, right internally as well as externally. And it's a core part of our business and a part, as, and a part of our management. The second component of, of our kind of our um, mantra is our core values. And there, we have four core values and they are treat others as you want to be treated, make the best product, give the customer a fair deal and maintain the highest standards. And we feel like if we can hold, hold to these core values with our creed, that not only will we be successful, but our customers will be successful and all of our associates will be as successful across GSF. And in an effort to make sure that we are successful, and you see it in our creed, we believe in the, in the commitment to people, not just any particular people, but all people. And we strive to make sure that we have a diverse group of people that represent all the, the people in the areas that we live and work. And we want to make sure that we bring all those thoughts and all those mindsets to the table, because we believe that diversity of thought will help us to be better and help us be successful within our businesses, but also with our customers. One of my favorite things about Golden State Foods is that we created the Golden State Foods Foundation. And we've, we made this foundation back in 2002. And the mission of our foundation is to help improve the lives of children and families in need in the areas where GSF associates live and work. And so, what we've done is we've empowered our local committees and where our facilities are to come together and to create these um, foundation committees that go out and raise money through either uh, fundraising efforts or through giving within the facilities. And all the money that they give within their facility, 100% of that money, go, they're able to then go out into their community to use to help children and families in need. We, we have programs where we give backpacks to kids in school, we give shoes to kids in school, we give coats to kids uh, in need of coats. And all of these programs are, are focused on helping children in need. And, and it's one of the areas that I'm most proud of that I was a, a part of from the start when we formed this back in 2002, and we've grown it to what it is today. We've raised over $40 million since 2002 with that money going back into the local communities where our facilities are. Another thing that we, we really have try to strive for is to make sure that we're doing the right things in the areas of sustainability. And we use, a lot of times we talk about the three E's, environment, ethics, and economics. And we know that if we wanna be successful in the long term, we can't always think about just today we have to think, think, of, think the long term, think about what we're doing to our world for tomorrow and the next day and for the next generation. So we continue to focus on sustainability and it's one of the pillars of our company. So I'm gonna switch gears now and talk a little bit about uh, you know, jobs and, and specifically I'll start off and just talk about my role at Golden State Foods. My current title is I'm a corporate vice president and president of protein products and operations services. I'm responsible for our protein division. I'm responsible for our corporate group for food safety, quality, and regulatory. I'm responsible for our corporate group for sustainability and our corporate group for environmental health and safety. And so I have a lot of different roles today that I grew to over the years. When I came to work at Golden State Foods 22 years ago, I started off as a raw material technical specialist. And what that meant was that I was responsible for working um, with our beef packing plants that were our suppliers to make sure that the, the raw materials that we got in met our specifications, they met our quality attributes that we were looking for. And I worked with them and to make sure that we were 
We were uh, aligned on what we needed and what they delivered. Also worked within our plants on food safety and quality, making sure that we had the right specifications in place and that we were doing the right things to make a safe, food safe product and wholesome product in our plants. And over the years, I did a lot of different jobs. I grew up, I grew from that role into an operations manager role. So I, I managed the plant um, uh, in, in our department. Uh, later on, I did the purchasing. So I bought the beef from our packing partners. And then later on, I, I did, um, uh, I managed the whole facility and I, and I continued to grow through the company and until I, I took on the role that I have uh, now. And I, I, I say all that to, to just let everybody know that when you come to work for a company, if you walk in the door with the expectation that, um, hey, I want your job, I wanna be the corporate vice president and the president of protein products and operations services, that's great. And that's, that, I, I mean, that's a great aspiration, but don't think that you walk in the door and suddenly you're, you're running the company. Um, you, you've got to work your way up. You've got to demonstrate that you have the abilities uh, to take on those responsibilities and to, to deliver the results for your company. Whether it's Golden State Foods or any company, you've got to be ready to work to prove your worth to the company. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the kind of jobs that we have at Golden State Foods. And there's really no way for me to cover every single job that we have at Golden State Foods. We have around 40 facilities. We have over 6,000 associates. And the fact is, you know, we can be considered a big little company, or if you compare it to, to some other companies like Nestle or McDonald's or Cargill, we're really a little big company. But either way you look at it, these jobs are consistent with what other companies in the food industry would have. And so let's just take a look at some of these jobs and talk about them. So, I'll start off just talking about manufacturing jobs. And manufacturing is the core, one of the cores of our business. And that just means that you're making something. And for us, we're making food products. I talked about our different divisions. Um, in the protein side, we make hamburgers. We make ground meat. In our liquid side, we make ketchup. We make nugget sauces. We make syrups. On our ice cream side, our, our, our can pack side, we make ice cream mixes. We make yogurts. Um, and we in in bottled drinks, uh, so we have all those. In the produce side, we make pro, we we package produce and we make it into a usable format for our customers. Uh, so all the bis different businesses, manufacturing is is the one that has a real wide breadth of, of of different roles. I put up here a list of jobs, but these are really just a list of areas. When within each one of these. There are multiple jobs and multiple levels of jobs that, that you could take on. If we take a look at executive leadership, um, that's really the management um, at a corporate level that gives direction to the whole company and, and helps to set goals and strategies for the whole company. Underneath that, we have plant management. In, in the plant management, you'll have a facility manager. Then you'll have an operations manager. And under the operations manager, you, you'll have managers for different areas of the plant. And then under the plant managers, you'll have supervisors. And so that's where you have your production supervision. And so under the production supervision, you'll also have lead people. You'll have hourly associates that are doing the different roles in all the plant. So literally hundreds of jobs in the, just those three buckets of, of jobs within the plant. Along with those, um, those roles, we have food safety and quality jobs within the plant. We do a lot of measurements and programs to ensure that our products are wholesome, safe, and meet the quality expectations of our customers. So we have a lot of jobs that, we have jobs that measure those, those attributes and make sure that we're meeting them, but we also have jobs that people establish what those are and what the right uh, specifications are. And they help us to determine what is the right safest way to make a different product. They also help us in the cleanliness of our plant. They help us to uh, make sure that we're getting the sanitation done in a manner that's gonna create a wholesome environment for us to make products. So a lot of jobs in food safety and quality. Um, product development, um, I showed you that uh, little video about innovation, but a lot, lot, of, lot goes into making different products. 
when you see a ketchup, you, you probably think ketchup is ketchup, but in actuality, every customer has their own specific formulation for their cut for their ketchup. And so those, those are the kind of things that product development do, along with coming up with new ideas for new products and things that, that the customers are looking for. They help develop and innovate those new products to go to customers who will ultimately take out into the field. Facility administration, within every facility, you have to, you, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that, that people are kept safe, that the facility is kept um, um, whole and, and in good repair. We have maintenance people. Again, this is an area where there's different levels. We have maintenance guys who are base level that just come in and fix stuff and uh, know how to um, do electrical things. They know how to weld. And, and then we have maintenance guys who are more of a supervisory or managing, managing capacity that know how to solve problems and uh, put, install equipment and, and bring things to life like that. We have engineers who come in and do layouts for how our plants should run the most efficiently and how the equipment should be set in place and what uh, the traffic flow should be in a facility. So all of those are things that have to be considered. Warehouse management, in all of our facilities, as we're making product, um, I'll just use our, our meat business. We, we make about 600,000 pounds of meat per day. So all of that product has to be stored. It has to be tested and then released and shipped out to the customers in an in a organized manner. So someone has to oversee that and make sure that all happens. And then finally, logistics. We have a, a distribution business and we call it last mile distribution where they are bringing products in and storing it and sorting it. And then they're packaging it up to send it out to customers. And all of that requires work within the warehouse facility, but it also requires uh, logistical work in terms of, you gotta have truck drivers. You have to plan all the routes. Uh, you don't want uh, the routes to be inefficient. You wanna make them as efficient as possible. So there's a lot that goes into the logistics part of the business as well. All of these are just, uh, touch the surface of the types of jobs, but a lot of jobs in the manufacturing part of our business. A second area would be administration. So as all those things are being done in, in the operations side, we have to account for it all. So we have an accounting group that takes, that counts, um, you know, what products we make, how much it costs to make those products, bills we have to pay, they take care of all that. Of course, we have to have a payroll department. We have to have someone who pays all of our associates on a weekly basis and, and make sure that they're paid correctly for the work that they've done. Uh, benefits administration, everybody wants health insurance. They wanna make sure their benefits are straight. So we have to have people in that area. Human resources, people wanna be taken care of. They want their needs met. And so we have to have people that take care of that. Uh, customer service, we have, to have, we have people who go out and work with our customers and make sure we're meeting their expectation and communicating with them on a regular basis and, and, and staying aligned with their business needs. Um, along with that is account managers and sales managers. Uh, sales managers actually are out there trying to find new customers for us so that we can continue to grow and thrive as a business. Another area that we have a lot of jobs in is our support services. I mentioned sustainability. We have a sustainability corporate director, but we also, within our divisions, we have people who focus on sustainability within the business units. Environmental health and safety, we have people at each one of our facilities who focus on making sure that we're keeping a safe work environment and a, a good work environment for, the, um, for all the associates that come into our facility as well as the visitors. IT. This is a big one. Informational technology um, used to be, you know, that you make sure that everybody has a phone, make sure everybody has um, connection to their email. But now most of our equipment is, is hooked into our um, informational technology system. And so um, we need uh, all levels of computer savvy people in our, in our IT side that can help us to keep the plants running, but also keep us looking for the next great thing. What's the next thing in business that from an informational technology side that we can implement and make our process even better? Uh, we have charitable foundation. I talked about the GSF foundation, but we have people that work in that area that make sure that the foundation is being 
run appropriately and that we're we're raising the appropriate funds so that we can continue to good, do good things in the communities where we work. Um, D Department of Transportation compliance. Uh, we have trucks that are on the road. All of those have uh, compliance issues that have to be dealt with. Risk compliance. Um, if you don't know what that is, it has to do with insurance and making sure that um, we have the appropriate um, uh, risk mitigating factors so that we can uh, lower the cost of, of, um, of compliance and making sure that we do the right things so that we don't hurt people and that we are covering the um, exposures such as um, uh, natural disasters and that we're ready for anything like that and that we can um, weather the storm if we need to. And then final, legal. We have uh, several lawyers that work for our company. We have a legal, a general counsel, and then he has a team of, of, of lawyers that work with him. A lot of what they do is contract, reviewing contracts and making sure that, that the contracts that um, we sign are appropriate and in, in, in the best interest of our company. Uh, and, and so we have a, a whole legal team that works with us in those areas. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit here about our product development group. You saw the video and you saw the chefs in the video. Those uh, chefs, um, they're making products. They're thinking of the next product that customers want. We have food technologists. A food technologist is someone who can either uh, develop a, a new product from, from nothing, from an idea, or uh, we have some that, are, that specialize in matching products. So if you come in and you say, I really like this ketchup, can, can you make me one that's like it? They will take that ketchup and they will match that product with something that's um, very, very close uh, to the same thing. We have lab specialists that do measurements of different um, um, elements of the products. We got packaging engineers and all kinds of uh, different uh, um, managers and technology uh, driven people who help us to make products for our customers for the future so they can continue to grow. One of the questions that Leanne put on the uh, guide sheet was to talk about salary ranges. And that's a tricky one. Um, if you don't know, most people don't like to talk about the money they make or the money that somebody else makes. So I'm not really gonna talk at specifics, but I do, we'll talk a little bit about salaries and what, what kind of salaries you can expect and how salaries work um, in a business like ours. First of all, there is a wide range. You know, we employ people everywhere from, you know, we hire some people that have no experience, no education uh, requirements but that just come in and they start at an entry level and they work on up. Um, and so, and then we have some people that we hire that are very specialized that they may have a law degree or some other, or a PhD or some other uh, specific uh, skill set that's going to give them, uh, make them more valuable in the work, work environment. So, um, very wide range on salaries, and I'll talk a little bit, I'll narrow it down a little bit more from there. But I, I would point out for people who are looking at jobs and thinking about jobs that um, the salary is only one component of compensation. And a lot of times people talk, talk in general about, you know, that this job makes this much money or that much money. And, and that, that's something to look at. But you also need to look at the rest of the, the compensation package that a, that a employer offers. Things like health coverage. Health coverage is one of the most expensive uh, benefits that an employer can offer, and, um, and, it, and it will vary from company to company. Some companies may offer full health coverage. Some may offer the, where they pay a portion of health coverage, and, and as, an, as an employee, you would pay a, a portion of that health coverage. And so between the two, you would, you would pay for your health coverage. So health coverage is a big form of compensation that you really want to make sure you understand when you're looking at a job. A couple of other things that to consider, some businesses offer bonuses, some offer car allowances, some offer long-term incentives, or, which is um, uh, some form of payment over time that, that they use to help retain people. So those are some things to consider when you're looking at a compensation package, not just uh, salary alone. But when we talk about uh, the, the, the payment that someone's gonna get as an employee, we break, uh, in general, we can break it into two big buckets. One salary positions and one is non-salary positions. 
a salary position is paid based on um, you working for the company. You don't lo- you don't clock in a certain number of hours. You are paid based on the fact that you work for the company, um, and the hours are not really um, measured. Um, so, in general, and this is not an absolute, but in general, most salary positions we, we're looking for they do require some kind of college degree or a certain number of years of experience in the specific area that we're hiring you for. So if you don't have a college degree, but you've worked in this particular area for 10 years, then that that experience could offset the fact that you don't have a college degree. Um, Depending on the location, sometimes salaries are higher and sometimes they're lower. If you live in uh, Sydney, Australia, you're probably going to get a higher salary than someone that um, lives in, say, Conyers, Georgia. And the reason why is the cost of living in Sydney, Australia is very high. And to be competitive in that workplace, you have to pay a higher salary. So um, that's another thing that as as an employee looking for a job, you also need to consider is what does it cost to live in the area that you're being hired to work in? Uh, because even though the salary may be higher, if the cost of living is also higher, uh, you, you've got to consider put that into consideration as well. But ultimately, the salary that, that a company is going to offer is going to be dependent on the responsibilities that are asked of the role that you're given and what you contribute to the value of the company. And and there's almost always a range in salaries. It's not a specific salary for a specific job because there's so many variables, such as your degree, your, your educational background, your experience background, um, what, what other uh, intangibles that you might bring to the company that's gonna help drive value for the company. So, <coughs> excuse me, I put on here that starting at $40,000 and goes and it's hot, good, just goes up from there. Uh, $40,000 for a bachelor's level degree coming in at kind of an entry level job, forty to $45,000 is probably a starting point. Uh, if you're coming in with a master's, maybe 50 to 55, if you're coming in with a PhD right out of school, you're probably looking at 70 to $75,000 to get started in, in, in a company like ours. But again, depending on where you're going to work and what after you each you bring, it could be higher than that. And it also depends on the specific market at the time you're looking for the job. If at that time you're looking for the job, they can't find any people that have these attributes that would drive the value up even higher. And, you know, it, you may think it's unfair to say higher, just higher because that really doesn't tell you how high it can go, but it really is dependent on the company in, in how long you've been with the company and how far you've worked your way up. But the upside is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, you, you can get a salary, um, really, there, I, I don't know that there's a top to it. Um, as long as you're adding value to the company, you can expect that you can uh, um, in, continue to increase your compensation uh, with that company. The second grouping or second bucket that I'll talk about is the non-salary positions. And these are positions paid for by the hour. And in general, when we just hire somebody off the street and they come in, they don't have any experience, they don't have any um, anything beyond a, like a high school education or a GED, then they're probably going to be starting around that $28,000 range. And they'll have the opportunity to gain experience and to grow and to take on new positions and to continue to move that up higher and higher. But most of these, these positions are paid by the hour. So you will, you will establish an, an hourly rate. And then for every hour you work, you will pay, be paid that hourly rate. But in the end, uh, it, it will, uh, at the base pay, at the starting pay, it will, it will start off somewhere around that $28,000 uh, range and then go up from there. Within this area, I'll tell you though, <clears throat> if you have technical skills like welding, or um, computer logic, things like that, those are highly sought after and that's gonna drive the value up. And that's gonna allow you to command a premium as a worker and, and it will allow you to um, ask 
ask for more and, and the employer will be ready to give you more because those are, um, those are technical skills. They're not readily available in the workplace and are highly sought after. So again, I put $28,000 in hire. I know some of our maintenance men make over $100,000 a year. They're, they work on an hourly basis, but they have a skill set that commands a high hourly rate and they're, and they're able to achieve a high total salary for the year. So while I didn't nail this down to specific dollars and cents, I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of what kind of salary ranges are available in these kind of roles. So what to do with my life? When, when I was asked to do this, I was told that, you know, it would be um, high school kids that are thinking about, you know, careers and where to go. And, and so my purpose here is not to tell you what to do or what kind of job you get or you should have, but it's really to tell you that um, you need to be thinking about what kind of job you want to do. Um, if you think of life as a journey that um, we all go on, um, you know, there, there's really one good way to get to your destination. And that's to map it out. And that's to sit back and think about, okay, I want to go from here to there. How do I get there? And yeah, there's always that one person that just jumps in the car and takes off driving and just ends up where they end up. Uh, but that's not really a, a good way to get to where you want to go, not just a, a random spot uh, on the map. So I always suggest that if, if you really want to get to where you want to go, you make a plan. You, you, you map it out. And when I think about my life, um, I, I, I always throw out there, though, uh, when you make this map, you got to realize there's going to be changes. When I graduated high school, I chose to go to college. I could have I had friends that took a job and went straight to work. I had friends that went in the military. Um, and, and I said, no, I'm, I'm going to college. But when I got to college, I figured out after about a year, I couldn't afford it. I didn't have the money to keep going to college. I was going to have to do something different. So I changed my plan and I went to the military. I joined the Marine Corps Reserves. And that allowed me to come back to college and then to continue on and pursue um, not only my bachelor's degree, but my graduate degree. When I got, got towards the end of my graduate degree, I again had a choice. Do I want to go back into the military? Did I want to get a job? What, what did I want to do? I, did, uh, I decided I wanted to get a job. After I finished my PhD, I took that job with the Beef Council and I loved it. But then I made another change. So another change. I started thinking that, that you know, hey, I don't, I don't see the the chance for advancement that I want in the long term. So I made another change. The bottom line is life is full of changes, and although we do make plans and plans are good, you also have to have that flexibility to change. And if we haven't learned anything from 2020, we all should have learned that you have to be prepared to make change and to make good decisions and then make the best or make the best decision you can at the time, but be willing to make changes to adapt to the situation you find yourself in. So I've mentioned that I, I believe that a big part of getting where you, you want to go is to, is to make a plan and part of making a plan is setting goals. And it, if you want to, you can Google goal setting and you will get more hits than you could ever look through on how to set goals and what good goals are and how goals work. And, and that's great. Uh, if you want to learn more, certainly go in there and take a look at goal setting. But the bottom line is you don't have to use any sophisticated formula at this point in your life the best thing you can do is start thinking directionally. What is it that I like to do? What is it that I want to do uh, for the rest of my life, or at least as a part of the rest of my life, what is it that I want to do? Now, you can always talk to your parents, and your parents may surprise you that they do actually know some things. For years, my son has said that I'm going to play video games, and I've, I've always questioned him, well, what do you, what do you mean you're going to play video games? You think you're going to be able to make a living at that? And, you know, of course, he said, well, I read that this guy made $200,000 last year playing video games as a video game tester. 
And um, well, okay, that that's that's great for him. But do you really think that that's something that you're going to be able to make a living in? To make a long story short, he's 17 now, and I think that he's realized that well, that's probably not a realistic goal and not a realistic uh, um, career path to embark upon. Now he still likes to play video games, but and he may actually that actually help direct him to where he wants to go, and he may want to. Uh, leverage that um, and, and follow a, an, uh, a, an IT path or some kind of um, computer path or video graphics path. I, I don't know where he'll go with it, but I think he has realized that just a straight going to play video games for a living probably ain't going to work out. And I think that's what you, you need to think about too. What is it that you like to do? Do you like working with animals? Do you like, do you like to work with food? or work with, a, um, or do you like to eat food? I'll take you back to the beginning where I said, everybody eats. And that was one of the deciding factors or one of the determining factors that helped guide me into a, um, into a career in the food industry is that I felt like this is something that's stable. It's not going away. Uh, I don't believe food is gonna be replaced anytime soon. I believe we're all gonna continue to eat. And so I see this as a great thriving area for people to get into um, as they grow, as they go um, through their lives, because there will always be jobs in food, I feel like. So as we get to the end here, um, I, I hope that you were able to learn a little bit about uh, Golden State Foods and, and what we do. Um, but agriculture starts at the farm. And, and, you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to, I thought, thought that I wanted to be a farmer for all my life and, and that didn't work out. But what I discovered while I was in college is that there's a vast industry beyond the farm that's full of opportunities. And companies like ours, like Golden State Foods, we always need hardworking, intelligent people to continue to grow and do the things that we want to do in our businesses. Um, Gold State Foods is just one company that makes uh, food products in the U.S. There are literally thousands of companies, some bigger, some smaller, but there are thousands of companies that make food um, in the U.S. and across the world. And, and those opportunities are not going away. So as you go through uh, school and you start looking at, um, you know, your future, I think it's a good idea to start thinking about what do you want to do and where do you how do you want to get to where you're going. And the sooner you make a decision of what you like and what direction you want to go, you can start making plans to achieve that goal. Because I'm going to tell you that some of the goals that you may set will require some pre-work. Some, some jobs require you to have a specific kind of degree. Some jobs require you to have a specific kind of skill set that you will need to obtain in order to make that goal. So the sooner you can get that directional sense for what you want to do, the sooner you can start working to prepare to get to reach that goal. And then finally, I'll just leave with changes are coming. Changes are, have always been here and they're not going away. So you just need to put that into your um, part of your plan is that periodically I'm going to look at what, what I have planned and what, what the current situation is. And then I'll make the adjustments I need to to continue to move me forward. So with that, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions about Golden State Foods or any of the things we've talked about tonight. Man, that was so wonderful. I actually got a comment in from a mom chiming in, which was awesome. She says, mom chiming in here. Wow, that was an excellent slide. What to do with my life and so well-spoken. Thank you. So that's pretty cool. Um, we do have a really cool question here uh, from Tina and Tegan. How many hamburger patties do you make in an hour? <laughs> so that's a, a trick question. So we have two, two parts of our operation. One is fresh and one is frozen. On the frozen side, we can do about uh, 40,000 pounds per hour. And um, that's 10 patties per pound. So 40,000 times 10 is 400,000 patties in an hour on the frozen side. On the fresh side, we don't make quite as much an hour. We make probably closer to 20,000 um, pounds per hour 
And those are four to one patties or quarter pounders. So there's four. So that's about 80,000 um, four to one patties per hour. Wow, that's pretty cool. That's impressive. <laughs> it's pretty cool just to hear some of those stats. And absolutely, if we've got some other uh, questions in here, definitely uh, chime in and put them in that chat box. We have another good question here. It says, what a neat company. This is kind of random. When you were talking about your Charlotte heifer, I think you mentioned something about calf scramble. <laughs> Did you get your heifer from the American Royal Calf Scramble Contest? Actually, I got mine at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo Calf Scramble con Contest, and I was actually the first catcher on my night. Wow, very cool. <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Um, love that. Super cool. So, that was a long time ago, but uh, <laughs> I, I still vaguely remember it. <laughs> that's really cool. Good question. Um, man, you've shared some really cool wisdom tonight. One of them, um, you know, obviously with this year that I take away is you constantly advocate that change is okay. And, you know, when you map out that plan and you're like, okay, I want to be an animal scientist. I want to go into research like I did. And then you're like, you've got to reassess and potentially have change. And I went into extension instead of research. And so, change is okay. And I think it's scary to think of that. And I really like that you're advocating for, um, you know, change is something that you have to be flexible with. And so thank you for pointing that out. I actually started off when I, when I graduated high school, I got a job um, as a runner for a law firm because I love to argue. So I thought law would be the thing. <laughs> um, but what I didn't love was sitting in an office uh, I would go to work at seven in the morning and I, um, uh, and like I said, I was just a, a clerk. I, I picked up papers, I filed files, I uh, ran errands, I took uh, bank deposits. And, and I decided after doing that for a while that I preferred to do something else. <laughs> Which is awesome that you share that because I think that really advocates for people listening in or watching this at a later date, that it's okay to go try things and job shadow or do an internship and challenge yourself to get out of your comfort zone and try something you might not even think you might like. So that's really cool that you did that. Oh, these are cool. Lisa, thanking you for your military service, the real heroes of our country. So definitely second that. Um, what would you say is probably your favorite part of your position that you're in now? Well, I, I mean, I, I like working with um, the, the people in the industry. I've been involved in the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef since its inception in 2015, and this year I'm the chairperson for that organization. But in that organization, um, it's a multi-stakeholder um, group that has it has beef producers, it has feeders, it has packers, it has other uh, produce processors. We have retail retailers, and we have um, a civil society. So NGOs like the the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund. And I like talking to, with groups like that that get the broad spectrum of the whole industry, and you get to look at issues that cross over the whole industry. So that's probably my favorite part is being involved in groups like that that are helping solve problems for the industry beyond the day-to-day -day problems that I might have at, at, at my company. Um, it looks at the larger issues that, that we're facing as a, as a society. I love that. That's really cool. Very, very neat. So Dr. Morgan, I've been actually asking this on almost all the calls so far, because I think it's a real key component to all the youth, um, whether you're in high school or college listening in. And so uh, it sounds like, you know, you've worked your way up. And so you've probably had to deal with this in many different aspects. So when I say first impressions, what does that mean to you? And what advice could you maybe give to those watching? So, you know, and that, that's almost a trick question also, because, you know, nowadays, everybody is so, um, they, they so much want to be politically correct, and they want to, um, a lot of times that means that I'm going to prove to everybody that I am different and that and I can do my own thing and that I can, I can do whatever I want, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But first impressions are, are what the person sees in you when they first open their eyes and see you for the first time. And 
if that's the first impression you want to leave that I'm different and I'm going to prove to everybody that I can do what I want, well, that's the first impression that you'll convey. But if the first impression that you want to convey is that I am a hard worker and I'm going to add value to your company, then you might want to look at that a little differently and frame it a little differently. And it's not that you have to bow to anyone or to, um, you know, um, do anything that's outside the, the scope of your beliefs. But I do behooves us all to think about if we want to get to where we're going, then we have to look at it from the other point of view. What does this person who's hiring or this person that I'm looking to impress, what do they want to see? And I can tell you, they don't want to see uh, someone who's going to come in and turn over the apple cart. They want to see someone that's going to come in and, and be a positive contributor to the company and help move the company forward in a, in a positive manner, not a disruptive manner. And so there are some times when disruption is needed, but it's, it's usually not during the interview process. I love that. Such wisdom because uh, it's, it's neat to hear everybody's perspective. And that was a really cool perspective. All right, this is a super fun question from Lisa. Um, I used to coach the horse judging team at the University of Florida for six years. So I love this. She's asking, what skills do you use that you gained from being on the judging team? And would you encourage kids to be on a judging team? Well, there, there are so many skills that you, I, I hear people talk all the time about, you know, the value of athletics. And I, and I agree, there are a lot of values in athletics and a lot of them are intangibles, but I'll tell you some of the things on, on livestock judging to me were just as valuable. Uh, first of all, just working with a team, uh, working with a group of people to get something accomplished. It's not all about the one individual, even though in livestock judging or, or any judging, usually there's an individual winner, but there's also a team aspect. And, and um, uh, I don't know if any of y'all have ever seen the movie uh, until Monsters, Inc., uh, but one of the competitions the two guys race to the end and they get through and then they figure out that it doesn't matter that they finish first and second. It's where the team finishes that counts. And, and I think that that's one of the things that I think is valuable, but one of the biggest values of all judging programs to me is helping people get the ability to communicate with someone. Communication is the biggest impediment uh, that, that, I, that we see in our company. When we talk about problems, that when we have a problem at one of our plants, it's usually, I mean, we have production problems where this equipment doesn't run, but those are all solvable. You just go out and you fix a piece of equipment and you move on. <laughs> but we have communication problems in every plant we have. We do an annual survey of our associates across the company, and it always comes back that the number one problem is communication. I'm not getting communicated with. And so, it, it does, it's not going away. Um, and, and all you can do is try and try and try again, but it starts with the individual one-on-one -on -one communication. And in livestock judging, I think that, that that was one of the things that I learned was how to formulate an idea and then present it in an organized manner um, so that someone else could understand the message I was trying to convey. That's pretty cool. Now, just curious, were you on a judging team at, in your 4-H years as well or just collegiate? Yeah, when I was in 4-H, I did judge locally, but I was I, I never went to beyond local. One of my, uh, my roommate in college was actually the, uh, he was the uh, national champion in 4-H livestock judging. So that would have been in 87. Wow, that's pretty exciting. Very, very cool. Keep those questions coming. I have another good one. All right. So whenever I get college kids in my office or 4-Hers, you know, a lot of the self-doubt starts to come in and they'll be like, ah, I can't do that. I'm going to fail. What mm -hmm. would you give for advice for people that get that sense of fear for failure? I've been doing this for 22, 23 years, and I still get nervous sometimes when I have to talk to a certain group or I have to uh, interact with a certain group. Um, and, and a lot of it is, is uh, you know, I, I think that's just part of some people. Some people uh, seemingly don't have it. They just bowl through everything. But, but I sympathize with, with people uh, when they have that self-doubt. When I started off at A&M, 
Dr. Griffith was one of uh, my professors and I worked for him and, and, and Dr. Sable and Dr. Larry Bowman. And when I listened to these guys talk, they had all the answers. It didn't matter what anybody asked. They had the answer. <laughs> and, and, I, and I always, it, it, it really, it, it did strike fear in me that how could I ever get up in front of a group of people and be prepared to answer all these questions the way they've done it? And, and so the first thing I think is preparation. I mean, I, 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 I listened to them. I tried to study. I tried to learn. And, and I tried to do things because I, I, f- I found that I learned more from actually getting out and doing things. And, but, and then the other element is just time. No one expects a, 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 a young person coming out of college to have all the answers. As a matter of fact, if you're coming out of college and you think you have all the answers, you're probably going to uh, find out real quick that you don't. Um, so um, I think that having realistic expectations of yourself is the first thing because nobody else expects you to know every single thing about every single thing. Uh, but then just, you know, work, good work ethic and, and learn things. And when you don't know something, admit you don't know it and go figure it out. Go learn about it. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. So good. Well, that has been an amazing wisdom bomb that you guys, you keep continue to drop. So thank you, Dr. Morgan, for sharing your guidance with uh, those that are watching. Is there any more questions out there that uh, you guys would like to, to say or ask? And if not, man, tonight has been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing such good wisdom. And I can't wait to... Uh, see what other people say when they watch this, because I know I learned a lot. So thank you so much for your time and sharing uh, stuff about your company and about yourself tonight. I know it's going to be incredibly helpful for a lot of you. Well, thank you all for inviting me. And I hope that uh, uh, you, you're able to get a lot of people to come to work in the food industry. Hey. We need them. <laughs> yeah, yes. All right. Uh, with that, I think we'll let you continue on to the rest of your evening. And thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.